Okay, Unit 5, Life and Death. And most of your reading for this unit comes from this book, which is by one of the editors of your textbook, Peter Singer, who is one of the most famous and influential of living philosophers. Um, he's not uncontroversial. Uh, he is... He's been around for a while, and he probably is initially most famous for writing a book called Animal Liberation, which defended, um, well, not the rights of animals, because he is influenced mostly by utilitarianism, and utilitarians don't tend to talk about rights, because, uh, as you should remember from the first unit, rights are kind of absolute and utilitarians say you can't give absolute rules because the circumstances may change and you have to maximize happiness in particular circumstances. But uh, he certainly argued that we were mistreating animals to a great extent and we should give them much greater uh, respect and uh, treat them better. Um, and that comes up in this book, uh, in a section in chapter 8 that we're not going to look at. You have access to the whole book, um, so if you want to read it, uh, I recommend it. As you can probably see from the chapters uh, that you are required to read, it's, it's an easy read. It's written for a general audience. Unlike a lot of the readings that you come across, it's not written for doctors or philosophers. It's written for... Uh, average people uh, and there's a lot of you know description and and minimal philosophy until perhaps the last chapter um, so Peter Singer uh, I it always makes me laugh this book because on the back um, they have a section that says praise for Peter Singer rethinking life and death and the first two are praise you know definitely praising it but if you look at the third one it says far from pointing a way out of today's moral dilemmas singer's book is a road map for driving down the darkest of moral blind alleys read it to remind yourself of the enormities which putatively civilized beings are capable that doesn't sound like praise to me um but it is an indication of the resistance that peter singer uh, meets um however i uh, i think I largely agree with uh, most of what he says, um, and I think uh, his his uh, way of doing philosophy, which makes it uh, relevant to everyday people, um, is the right way to go about it. And his writing style is to be emulated as clear and straightforward as possible. All right, let's plunge into what he says. So. In the first couple of chapters, which you skip, but again, I recommend you read if you have time, uh, Singer describes how the criterion of death in the United States was changed. Um, in the old days, the criterion of death was essentially you're dead if you stop breathing. And they used things like they would place a mirror in front of your mouth to see if, it missed, if your breath misted up the mirror. And if it didn't, you know, they, they check your pulse, of course, and things like that. And if it, you're not misting up the mirror, then you're dead. So there were these... We should draw a distinction, as uh, Ari Joff does in, uh, Joffy does in the um, more recent article that I had you read. We should draw a distinction between a criterion of death and a concept of death. And let me explain what I mean by the difference. A criterion of death is simply a way of telling whether or not you're dead. So, for example, the mirror in front of the mouth would be a criterion of death. Whereas, on the other hand, um, a concept of death explains what death is. So, the criterion of death is a way of telling whether or not you are dead. Um, like if you have no pulse or whatever. But the criterion of death relies on a concept of death. That is, you need to know what death is before you can come up with a way to check whether or not you're dead. If you have no clear concept of what it is to be dead, 
then how do you know what counts as an indication that you are dead? Um, so, for example, um, a criterion of having a dead battery in your car is if you turn the um, starter and it just makes a click and nothing happens. So that's a way to check, but that only makes sense if you understand that the starter motor is run from the battery and things like that. You have to have a, an understanding of what's going on, that's the concept, before the test makes sense. Now, um, what the Harvard committee that Singer refers to in, um, in his article, and he talks about in detail in the chapters that we skipped, they try to come up with a concept of death, what it is to be dead. And uh, they decided that it was um, whole brain death. Now, Singer argues that there's a reason that they decided that. And it was essentially because of the invention, or because of two inventions. Uh, the invention of heart surgery, Christian, Dr. Christian Barnard performed the uh, first heart, successful heart transplant in the late 60s, around um, when this was going on. And also the invention of artificial respirators. And artificial respirators in particular were keeping alive many people who in the old days would not have survived. Um, for example, people in persistent vegetative states. These people now uh, were um, the respirator could keep them breathing. So uh, in most cases, these people would have just died of, of, we might say, natural causes in the old days because they, uh, they couldn't really breathe by themselves um, and consequently they just would have died. So there was no real moral issue. Uh, we couldn't keep them alive anyway, so they just died. Whereas with the invention of the respirator, now you had people whose cortexes were irreparably damaged. In other words, uh, they're never going to have any sensations or thoughts ever again, but they didn't die. And in fact, if you uh, put a feeding tube in them and you put them on a respirator, they could stay alive indefinitely or up to their natural lifespan in some cases. And if, you know, the standard is they, uh, is do they have a pulse, then they're alive. Uh, but consequently, Hospitals were sort of, wards were filling up with these people, people who got into serious car accidents, for example, uh, and they had to be kept alive because they were, by the old standard, alive. Meanwhile, at the same time, uh, we had this new technology of being able to do heart transplants, but the difficulty with a heart transplant is you have to have a living, beating heart. In other words, you can't take out a heart keep it frozen for months and then implant it, uh, as you can do with, understand, liver and kidneys, um, you have to, maybe not months, but you know, you, you can keep them uh, on ice for a while. Whereas with a heart, it has to be practically taken from, beating from the chest of one person before it can be put into uh, another one. They've been to, uh, so it has to be, in a sense, the donor has to have a beating heart. How can a donor have a beating heart? That sounds like they're alive. They certainly are alive by the old standard. So what the Harvard Committee decided is that some people whose hearts are beating are dead because they are, and this is where the new phrase came in, brain dead. And so brain death became the new standard of death. But it was whole brain death. That is, you were only dead if all of your brain was dead. Uh, now, there, for our purposes, you can divide the brain into two key elements. There's the large bulgy bit, the cortex, uh, that you do your thinking with, and uh, that can be destroyed. But that can be destroyed and you're still able to breathe because what regulates your breathing and other functions like hormones and, and things like that in your body is your brain stem. But of course, your brain stem has nothing to do with thinking. So people... Uh, in fact, anencephal anencephalic children, anencephalic, anencephalic, anencephalic. I looked it up and I can't remember what it was. Anencephalic, let's say that. Anencephalic 
children are children born literally lacking a cortex, but they do tend to have a brain stem. So some of these children can actually survive even if they're not on a respirator because their brain stem can regulate activity. And they can they have reflexes and things like this. As it uh, points out in the Ari Joffe article, if you try to cremate an anencephalic child, even though it has no concept of pain, it isn't suffering, we are, we're pretty sure, uh, the body reacts as a normal body would. It would cringe and uh, the heart rate would go up. Um, so that certainly seems like you're destroying a living creature. Um, so the uh, Harvard standard is that the whole brain has to be de dead, including the stem, which means that, of course, a lot of the possible uh, uh, donors of organs count as alive, not just by the old standard of, you know, do they have a pulse, but also by the new standard, because not all of their brain is dead, just their cortex. Uh, so Singer's discussion, uh, starting in chapter 3, is whether or not the new standard, well, relatively new brain death standard, is itself um, outmoded. And uh, this is the reason why I had you read the Ari Jaffe article as well, is because this Singer book is quite old, it's from the 90s, uh, whereas the Ari Jaffe article is much more recent. But as you can tell from reading the Ari Jaffe article, uh, he basically agrees with Singer. He's got the same points that um, in practice people aren't using the whole brain criterion. They're uh, taking organs from people who would count as alive by the whole brain definition. And uh, he recommends basically the same thing as Singer does, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so that's the background. The background is talking about the criterion and concept of death. And as Jaffe says, one of the problems that you discover in polling healthcare professionals is that you find they understand the criterion, they know what to check for, or in some cases they don't even know that, but even the people who do know what to check for don't really have a concept of death. And in fact, the, if you ask them what they believe death is, it sounds like they don't believe the people that count as dead by the brain death standard are really dead. Okay, so let's look at chapter three of Singer, Dr. Shan's Dilemma. Dr. Shan is at this conference that Singer is attending, um, and he recounts this story of when uh, he's faced with two babies at the same time. We have one baby whose brain was, uh, whose cortex was irreparably damaged, and another baby who had serious heart issues. Both of them would die if we didn't do anything. But what Shan knew is that if he took the heart from the uh, cortically dead infant, he had a good chance of saving the life of the uh, infant whose brain was fine, but who had serious problems with their heart. But because of the uh, because of this standard that uh, the you cannot take organs from someone who's alive, um, and because the while the infant was cortically dead, its brain stem was intact and it was still uh, able to regulate breathing and things like that, that baby did not meet the whole brain standard of death. So you couldn't couldn't be an organ donor, and therefore. Dr. Shan had to watch helplessly as these two babies died when he thinks he should have been able to save one. Now, why was he prepared to sacrifice the cortically, the, the infant with an irreparably damaged cortex? Because he believes, well, there, there's two things that you could say. One of them is because he believes that the cortically dead, but with an intact brainstem, that infant should count as dead and therefore be a candidate for donating organs. Or you could say that while that infant is alive, it should nonetheless be an organ donate, donor. Now what's radical about that second approach is that you're saying uh, that we should judge qualities of life. That is, we should say that although the infant with the damaged, irreparably damaged cortex 
is technically alive, it's nonetheless uh, we can cause its death and take its organs because its death, uh, because its life is of less value to it, to it than the baby with the damaged heart, than its life is to it. Um, and this is seen as radical because you're judging quality of life. You're saying that some qualities of life are lower than others and that we can sacrifice the people of the lower quality of life to save the people of the higher quality of life. And that seems, uh, many critics have suggested, dangerous. Um, where might that lead to? They give slippery slope arguments like uh, maybe we'll decide poor people's quality of life is not good enough so we can, you know, harvest their organs to give to the rich or something like that. I'm sure there's a science fiction movie where that happens. Um, Singer wants to argue that these slippery slope arguments are um, misplaced and that actually we all really agree with this, that our practice is already making this decision. We're just lying to ourselves about it. So that's uh, the major underlying current of this and that's what's going to lead to what he, said, what he says in chapter 9 about replacing the old ethic which is a sanctity of life ethic, which says that life is life is life, all human life is the same, the life of an anencephalic baby is worth the same as the life of a baby with a damaged heart, so you can't kill one to uh, save the other. Um, and he says we should replace that. And in fact, in our practice, we already have replaced that with uh, a quality of life ethic. All right, so um, Dr. Shan on page 42, uh, argued, I suggest that the organ that really matters is the cerebral cortex, that is the part of your brain that um, does the thinking. If the cortex is dead, there is permanent loss of consciousness and there can be no person. If the cortex of the brain is dead, the person is dead. I suggest that it should be legal to use the organs from the body of the dead person for transplantation. All right, well, <clears throat> what does he mean by person? Well, in philosophy, the term person doesn't just mean human being. Uh, and in fact, it can, um, let me draw a little Venn diagram to explain what I mean by the difference. In philosophy, and in particular, people like Singer believe this, um, we make a distinction between humans and persons. Now, there is significant overlap between them. It probably should represent the majority of the two circles. And in fact, that little x represents you and me. Both you and I are um, both humans and persons. I'm assuming no aliens are watching this. Uh, if, if you are, I hope you come in peace. We are both humans and persons. We're humans because we're of a certain species, you know. Um, we are of the human species. We're not snails, for example. But what makes us persons is that we have a certain set of capacities. Uh, the, the, the philosopher who did most to talk about this initially is an English philosopher called John Locke, who is also the person who wrote uh, the document that was basically your constitution is a ripoff of. So he was enormously influential on the Founding Fathers. Um, so John Locke, there's a character in the TV series Lost, if you ever watched that, who is named after him. Um, he was the first person to introduce this term uh, person and distinguish it from human being. And he says a person is a being that has capacities for consciousness in particular and also generally speaking higher thought so for example what counts as a person might include the ability to use language and things like that now uh, we tend to think that we're the only persons that human beings are the only persons there are however singer would argue that's not true 
if you give a list of uh, capacities that are, if you make raise the bar too high on what counts to be a person, then a lot of um, otherwise functioning human beings wouldn't count as persons if you demand, you know, ability for higher math or something. But if you lower it to include most uh, humans that we would count as persons, then you have to include uh, beings like Coco the gorilla. He mentions Coco the gorilla. If, you, if you've not heard of Coco the gorilla, she was a gorilla. I think she died recently. Yes, she did. Um, Coco the gorilla was a gorilla who had been taught to use sign language. So she could actually communicate using language with, uh, with human beings. And um, she uh, very famously had a pet kitten of which she was very fond and she was very sad. She was, uh, who was it? I think uh, Mr. Rogers met her and then they told her that Mr. Rogers died and she was sad, she signed that she was sad about that. So she would meet the standard of a person by depending on how you, you define person. Now, of course, what counts as person is another whole nother issue that we're going to get into. That That is covered a lot in the issues of abortion because we want to discover is uh, a, an unborn fetus a person yet and also in the issue of animal rights how many animals count as persons but also you can imagine that if there were intelligent aliens then um, they would count as persons too but of course they would they would not be humans so they would fall Coco the gorilla and intelligent aliens would fall into this part of the person circle the part that does not overlap with humans Meanwhile, over here in the part of the human circle that does not overlap with persons seem to be um, people in persistent vegetative states, anencephalic um, infants, people like that who are clearly human yet have lost capacities that you need to have to count as person. And that's what Dr. Shan is talking about. He says, if the cortex is dead, there is permanent loss of consciousness and there can be no person. He's not saying, of course, that the human being vanishes. No, the human being is there. The human is still there. Um, but the person has gone. So what's interesting about this is that while you or I always remain in the human circle, we start out outside of... Uh, the person circle because when I am I let's say I talk about when I was conceived I don't like to think about that nobody likes to think about the, what their parents do to conceive themselves um, but let's say there was a time when I was conceived when my father's sperm met my mother's egg just saying that makes me feel dirty um, and then you might say that was when I came into being but I certainly was not a person. Clearly, I was human. I had human DNA. I wasn't uh, a goldfish or something. But I didn't have anything close to person-like capabilities. I didn't have a brain yet. Uh, I didn't have a nervous system. That wouldn't come till much later. So I existed as a human before I existed as a person. Then let's say at a certain point, I acquire person characteristics. My brain has developed enough to feel to, to be conscious or something like that. So I, I, I'm then where that acts is. But then let's say something bad happens to me. Uh, I, I get a brain bleed, which destroys my cortex, like what happened to Tony Bland. And I'm back outside of the person circle. I'm just a human again. So our life can dip in and out the, uh, of the um, person circle. Now, in saying that, I'm, I'm already creating a, a controversy because the issue is, what is it that the, when I say I, what is it that the I refers to? Does the I refer to the human or does it refer to the person? When do I cease to exist? Dr. Shan clearly seems to be implying that I am the person. That is, that when, if something happens to my cortex and I would never be able to think again, I'd be gone. There would be something left. There would be this body, but it wouldn't be me. It would just be my remains, you might say. The body that used to house me. Um, and a lot of philosophers agree with that point of view. Uh, other philosophers say, no, I am the human being. But even some of the philosophers that say, I am the human being, 
say it makes perfect sense to care more about the person than uh, the human being. So, for example, there's a philosopher called Eric Olson who defends animalism, which is the view that we are human beings, we're not persons. But even he says it's perfectly uh, permissible for me to say if my brain if my brain is destroyed then don't keep me alive he says there's nothing wrong with that point of view there's nothing wrong with ceasing to value the human when it can no longer think okay um, that's a lot of background but it should help you to understand something that Joffe says if you look at the table in Joffe's article on page 313 uh, he talks about table 33.1 he talks about the criterion of brain death in the first column the rationale for why it is death and then flaws in the rationale in the third column if you look at the second criterion of brain death which is higher brain death this is saying that we are dead when our cortex is destroyed which seems to be the view that Dr. Shan is advocating his flaw within this rationale, rationale, in other words, what Joffe is saying is a problem with it, he says this implies personal essentialism. What he means by that is the view that I am essentially a person rather than a human being, which means that I didn't, I wasn't conceived. If I am the person, then I only started to exist when my brain reached a certain level of development. So in other words, I was never conceived and probably never born because this probably happens, as Singer suggests, this happens sometime after you're born. Your brain, when you're born, is still uh, very, you know, poorly formed. Uh, you, can't, you can't really um, make memories when you're born. So people who claim to remember being born don't believe those people, um, if you know any of them. So he, when he says this implies personal essentialism, that we are essentially persons, and we're never a fetus or newborn, that's what he means. He says, if he, I am essentially a person, then I began when consciousness started in this body, which was sometime after birth. So I didn't exist in the womb, because the thing that was in the womb, the fetus, wasn't conscious and therefore wasn't a person. Now, if you're a, uh, someone like Singer, that's not a criticism, but it, there are certainly some odd, it, it certainly seems a little odd to most people. And he says, uh, the second problem with this view, says Joffe, is that this means that a patient in a persistent veg permanent vegetative state with movement, weight cycles and breathing can be buried or cremated in that state. Because if you're saying that they're dead when the, there is no person, then somebody who uh, whose body is alive um, you're saying counts as dead and therefore you could take somebody who's breathing and stick them in um, you know the furnace at the crematorium which seems barbaric of course so that's what he's saying if you if you believe this if you're saying that this is what death is then you should go along with that and that just seems crazy but of course what we already do is we harvest organs from these people. Um, now, Dr. Shan and Dr. Truog agree, both agreed that uh, it should be the higher brain criterion of death. So they're both arguing that we should change the criterion of death from where it currently is, whole brain death, to higher brain death. And that's that you are dead when your cortex is gone. Doesn't matter if your brain stem is still alive. Uh, so Truog said, death is the irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness. Now, a Dr. Margaret de Campo, who is a radiologist at this conference Singer is attending, says that thanks to new procedures that didn't used to exist when the Harvard uh, committee were making their decision, uh, something called three-vessel angiography, we can tell in which sections of the brain blood is still flowing. If blood is not flowing to the cortex, then the patient is cortically dead. So we have a way of telling if the patient is cortically dead. Uh, Dr. Neil Campbell also agrees. He says, what we care about is the person rather than the body, and the person dies with the cortex. At which point, there is no meaningful sense in which it can be claimed that decision about life support or organ removal matter to him, and him or her. Someone who is arguing against the, this general trend is Dr. Steve Keeley, who said regarding anencephalic 
and cortically dead infants as dead would create an ethical fiction because it would suggest that we would, should bury a child who can still breathe on its own. Um, so you see the divide. Now, um, what everybody at this conference agreed with is uh, that there is a shortage of organs and that if we count anencephalic babies and cortically dead infants as alive and that therefore they cannot be a source of organs, then more children like the child with heart problems that Dr. Shan uh, was talking about will die. Uh, now, if you're if you believe in the sanctity of life, you would say, well, too bad, because the sanctity of life says all lives are equal, they're all sacred, and you cannot uh, sacrifice one to save the other. Um, okay, because we have a shortage of organs, what should we do? Well, there were three positions at the conference. One, and this seemed to be Dr. Shan's and Dr. Truog's position. Basically, redefine death from whole brain death to death of the cerebral cortex, uh, higher brain death. Now, this solves the problem because now it says that the anencephalic infant is dead and therefore you can take organs from it. But of course, the organs are more useful than normal dead people because the heart is still beating. Uh, obvi an obvious weird effect of this, as pointed out by Dr. Keeley, is that you're calling people who are dead, who are pink and warm and possibly can even breathe on their own, depending on the state of their brainstem. Some people who are active brainstems, they don't even need a respirator because their brainstem can regulate their breathing for them. Uh, and you're saying we can cremate or bury those people and they're pink and warm and breathing. That just seems weird and most doctors would agree. So that's the problem with redefining death. It would solve the problem of shortage of organs, and it would mean that we could save uh, the baby with the heart disease, but um, it does seem to create an ethical fiction, as Keeley said. The, uh, a second view was don't refine, redefine death and don't remove the organs. That was Dr. Keeley's view. Of course, the, the effect of that is Dr. Shan has to watch both babies die. Uh, Singer's view is don't redefine death because of what Keeley said. If you redefine death, uh, Singer agrees that Keeley has a point. It seems crazy to call somebody who's pink and breathing dead. That just seems weird. So don't redefine death. Say that those people are still alive. However, accept that you can take organs from some alive people. So get rid of this, um, get rid of this rule that uh, Joffe says as calls the dead donor rule. Um, yes, this is on page 318. The dead donor rule is that, you know, if you're taking organs from somebody, they have to be dead. And what uh, Singer says, no, get rid of that rule. Say that you can take organs from some people who are alive, provided their life is no longer of value to them because they're, they're high, they meet this higher brain death standard. Um, so, here's what Singer suggests on page uh, 54, a way forward. He says, is we've got to separate three questions that seem to get lumped together. The first question is, when does a human die? And then the second question is, when is it permissible to stop trying to keep a human being alive? And normally, uh, we've treated those two questions at the same. That is, so long as a human being is alive, you have to keep them alive. So you can only stop trying when they're actually dead. So they've treated the when does a person, human being die and when is it permissible to stop trying to keep them alive as the same question. Singer says we've got to keep those apart because there may be some, uh, some humans like uh, anencephalic children or cortically dead people on respirators like Tony Bland um, that they're alive but we shouldn't try and keep them alive. And then the third question is when is it permissible to remove organs from, uh, from a human being for the purpose of transplantation? And again, uh, it's because of the dead donor rule, it's been assumed that you can only do that when they're dead, whereas he says, no, Tony Bland and anencephalic babies are alive, uh, are alive 
but their life is of no value to them. So therefore, we don't have to keep them alive. And in the case of the anencephalic child, by the time Tony Bland's organs are probably damaged by the time he gets to the state he's in. Um, but if, if they're intact, then you could remove them too. So that brings us to chapter four, Tony Bland and the Sanctity of Human Life. Uh, yeah, I remember this vividly, this um, incident. This was uh, Hills, the Hillsborough disaster. This was a football, as we call it, because you kick a ball with your foot, um, or soccer, as it is more often called over here. I can't complain about the term soccer because English people invented it. It's short for association football, uh, because to distinguish it from rugby football, which we just call rugby now. Uh, anyway, um, Tony Bland went to a football match to see his favourite team, um, I believe it was Liverpool, it was Liverpool versus Nottingham Forest, but they were playing at the ground that belongs to, um, is it Sheffield Wednesday or Sheffield United? I think it's Sheffield Wednesday, which is called Hillborough. It's in Hillsborough. It's in uh, Sheffield, which is one of the biggest cities in England, where my sister and mother live. Um, they, uh, because of... Well, well, this has actually been a long-running legal dispute that he doesn't get into. Only recently was it decided that the deaths were the fault of police forcing fans into a caged area because they they wanted to prevent um, they wanted to prevent uh, rival fans fighting. So they herded them into this area and crammed them in so that people were crushed against uh, like nearly ninety. Uh, I think over ninety people were killed by being crushed against. Uh, the fence that was divided the the stands from the pitch and um, it's only recently been decided that it was uh, the fault of the police it was blamed on the fans for the longest time and in fact uh, in the city of Liverpool the tabloid the Sun which is uh, the flagship tabloid of Rupert Murdoch's empire in Britain it lacerated the fans and said you know the fans are responsible for all this death uh, when, of course, the, it wasn't them at all. They were being forced in by the police, and uh, there have been all kinds of legal repercussions fairly recently about this. Anyway, all of that is pointless background, but it's interesting. The important point is uh, Tony Bland was left in a situation where his cortex was dead. And he was kept alive in a persistent vegetative state, like between 20, 10 to 25,000 adults and four to ten, plus four to ten thousand children in America in nineteen in nineteen ninety four, so that's up to thirty five thousand people, uh, including adults and children, uh, in persistent vegetative states. This is in nineteen ninety four, and you can bet there's a lot more by now. Um, why are they being kept alive? In in uh, uh, probably the majority of cases, the family don't want them kept alive because they believe that they're because their brains are no longer functioning they will never think again it's just keeping them alive until their body packs in but they can't talk they can't think they can't feel uh, I think most of us believe uh, if because I you know when I was teaching in a classroom I, I would ask people and the vast majority of students said if I'm in that situation unplug me uh, it's no point. I, I'm gone at that point. Um, but according to the sanctity of life ethic, uh, you cannot kill, you cannot unplug Tony Bland. That's as bad as murdering you or, you or me because all lives are of equal value. That's uh, the notion of the sanctity of human life, that all lives are intrinsically valuable, so it is always wrong intentionally to kill an innocent human being is clearly noble. But, uh, Singer says, it disguises real decisions that we have to make. Now, what's interesting about the case of Tony Bland is that it was brought to the equivalent of the Supreme Court in England, which is the Law Lords, and they made a decision that essentially, um, uh, without explicitly saying so, undermined the sanctity of human life ethic. Because it said that Tony Bland 
while obviously alive by the criteria that we have, can nonetheless be unplugged because his life is of no uh, value to him. So Lord Mustill uh, said that since the continued treatment of Anthony Bland can no longer serve to maintain that combination of manifold characteristics which we call a personality. Again, there's that term person. It mean, what he's saying is essentially is that Tony Bland is now outside the person circle and in the human circle only and that therefore uh, it's okay to kill him. Uh, Singer says on page 67 slash 8, there can therefore be no doubt that with the decision in the Bland case, British law abandoned the idea that life itself is a benefit to the person living it, irrespective of its quality. The conclusion we can draw is that British law now holds that for life to be a benefit to the person living it, that person must, at a minimum, have some capacity for awareness or conscious experience. Um, so, in other words, uh, a quality of life ethic. Uh, section, uh, the section that starts on page 70, the uh, discarding a fig leaf. Now, what does he mean, discarding a fig leaf? Well, of course, a fig leaf is like in the uh, Garden of Eden after they eat the apple. They realize that they're naked and they have to cover their nakedness. But fig leaves are very bad at that. So in other words, uh, a fig leaf metaphorically is something that is a bad cover-up for reality. And what he's suggesting is that really our behavior makes it clear that we have abandoned the sanctity of life ethic long since. And just claiming that we, uh, that we hold to it is we're fooling ourselves. So let's stop fooling ourselves. Um, now, what does he mean? Well, he means that people try to make it seem like they're uh, keeping to the sanctity of life ethic by inventing bogus, dubious distinctions. And the most obvious of these is something called the distinction between extraordinary and ordinary uh, treatment. Um, that is, so what happens with people in persistent vegetative states often is that uh, the decision is made that we can unplug them. Now, they don't want to say that we're killing this person. This person is alive and we're killing them. They said, they say that we're allowed to withdraw extraordinary treatment. You're obviously not allowed to withdraw ordinary treatment. So for example, think of people in, who have COVID-19 serious cases, all these respirators we've built them. You know, they're on a respirator for a certain time to keep them alive. And the hope is that they will get better. Uh, suppose it looked like someone was getting better on a re respirator for COVID-19. And they said, ah, but a respirator is extraordinary treatment. We'll just turn it off. And they died. That would be not allowed. That, that would be a serious violation. And they could p potentially be tried for murder. So in that case, a respirator is ordinary treatment. That is treatment that you are required to give. Extraordinary treatment you are not required to give. But of course, we're, we're classifying exactly the same thing, a respirator, as extraordinary treatment for people like Tony Bland or Karen Quinlan. But it would be ordinary treatment for somebody with COVID-19. What's the difference? It's the same treatment. So Singer says this, this is just an attempt to disguise the fact that really what we're saying is that this life, Karen Quinlan's or Tony Bland's, is not worth living, whereas this life, the person with COVID-19, is. And that's why a respirator is ordinary treatment for in this case, because we're saving someone whose life is worth living, whereas it's extraordinary treatment in this case, because we're, it's keeping alive somebody whose life is not worth saving. Um, the other distinction we make is between acts and omissions. So, for example, um, we often make decisions. There, there are some cases uh, where there have been cases uh, where people, uh, babies have been born with Down syndrome. But a not uncommon accompanying side effect of having Down syndrome is you have a blockage, an esophageal blockage, 
which means that your stomach cannot receive food to digest it. In the old days, and possibly still today, uh, they have made the decision not to operate on that infant. So, consequently, it starves to death because with the blockage there, it cannot receive nutrition. Now, could they remove the blockage? Yes, they could. If the baby did not have Downs, they would absolutely do that surgery. They would absolutely do that surgery, and doing that surgery would count as ordinary treatment. But because they've decided we don't want that baby to live, but we don't want to, but we can't kill the baby because that would be murder, but we don't want the baby to live. So we'll just say that operating to save the baby's life is extraordinary treatment and we don't have to do it. Singer says this is just cruel. Look, if the, you've decided that the baby's quality of life is not sufficient to live, then don't let it starve to death slowly over days. Just give it an overdose of morphine. Put it out of its, put it out of its misery, if it indeed it is in misery, immediately. Uh, but of course, that is ruled out by the sanctity of life ethic that says you cannot ever kill somebody, but you don't necessarily have to work too hard to keep them alive. So Singer is arguing, uh, saying that there's a bright line between acts and omissions, that you can never act toward, to cause someone's death, but you can not do something that will lead to their death. That's just, again, that's a fig leaf. We're kidding ourselves. The end result is the same, death. And if that's what we're trying to achieve, let's go there quickly. Let's give them an overdose of morphine. Um, so, uh, were the law lords in effect sanctioning euthanasia? Euthanasia, of course, literally means mercy killing in the Tony Bland case by allowing a doctor to intentionally end his life. They didn't think so. They relied on a distinction between acting to end someone's life and allowing someone's life to end. In terminating treatment to Bland, the doctor is allowing them to die by natural causes. Um, the doctor was not administering a lethal dose. But um, even some of the law lords had a problem with this. Uh, Lord Brown Wilkinson, for example, on page 77, says, look, you, it's easy to manipulate this distinction between acts and omissions. We say that unplugging the respirator is an act and therefore we can't do it. But what if we just put a timer on the respirator so that to keep it going you have to keep pressing the button and then we don't press the button. In effect, we, re we achieve the same result by refusing to press the button, it automatically turns off and the person dies. So is that inaction because we're not doing something or is that the same as the action of turning off uh, a respirator? It's a bogus distinction in other words. Although Lord Brown Wilkinson didn't uh, of officially say we should discard it. That's what Singer is saying. Uh, and Lord Brown Wilkinson also says, how can it be lawful to allow a patient to die slowly though painlessly over a period of weeks from lack of food, which is when you remove the feeding tube, but unlawful to produce his immediate death by lethal injection, thereby saving his family from yet another ordeal to add to the tragedy that has already struck them. So Lord Brown Wilkinson is arguing that this acts and omissions distinction is bogus. Um, which sort of leads us into chapter 9, where uh, Singer says, we've got to replace the sanctity of life ethic which is the one we claim to cling to, but is already crumbling because of the things we do. We wouldn't, if we seriously kept to this um, ethic, this sanctity of life ethic that we claim to keep to, we, uh, we wouldn't be removing organs at all. We wouldn't be taking a beating heart from somebody, but in order to give someone a heart, you have to take it from someone whose heart is still beating. We wouldn't be allowed to do that if we seriously kept to the sanctity of life ethic. Um, and, you know, it's also causing us to take to do ludicrous things like allowing babies to starve to death um, rather than just giving them an overdose of morphine. If their life is worth living, keep them alive no matter what. Operate them. Take it seriously. But if you really believe their life is of a low enough quality that they shouldn't live, then get it over with, he says. 
admit that you're making a quality of life decision. Now, Singer is not necessarily endorsing uh, the, the quality of life distinction that says that a uh, Down syndrome child shouldn't live. Although some of the things he says in chapter 9 are probably what this person was talking about. Because he, uh, Singer, to be consistent, allows infanticide in some cases. Um, that is not just abortion but the killing of infants because they're not yet pers persons. He says in a book he and Helga Kuzer, who is another of the editors of our textbook, wrote called Should the Baby Live? They suggest that you have 28 days after birth to make a decision. If the baby gets to 28 days, then you cannot, nobody can decide to cause its death. But before that time, the parents can decide. And of course, in other cultures, they did decide, like he talks about the Japanese uh, culture of um, babies being returned that if a baby is born that is severely disabled, that it can be killed, essentially. And other cultures, like uh, notoriously the first Westerners who encountered what we called Eskimos at the time, who were Inuit peoples, reported that they put unwanted babies out on the ice to die because they had severely restricted resources and they couldn't support. That was their form of contraception, essentially. Um, okay, back to in place of the old ethic. Uh, he begins this with the structure of ethical revolutions. This is actually a play on a famous book in philosophy of science uh, by a guy called Thomas Kuhn that was enormously influential called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what Kuhn argued in this book is that science doesn't just progress like this, it moves in discontinuous jumps. So we have a, a, a Newtonian view and then it goes and goes and goes and then suddenly it's replaced by an Einsteinian view and, and Kuhn said those those two views are not compatible and essentially what um, Singer is saying is that the we, we've had a sanctity of life ethic and it made perfect sense until our medicine advanced to a certain point that uh, caused it to, to ha crumble, to have problems. Same thing happened with Newton that Newton's theory worked and worked and worked until we made some discoveries that couldn't be explained in terms of Newtonian physics. So it looked like the old theory was in trouble and then along came Einstein and his theory explained these things that we've discovered and that therefore that was a reason to abandon the old theory and replace it with the new theory. And Singer is saying the same thing is true of our ethics, that the sanctity of life theory made perfect sense when you know, the way that we could tell whether or not someone's alive was to take their pulse and put a mirror in front of them. But now we've got all these sophisticated technologies and we can see there's all these different ways people can be damaged. They can have uh, a cortical damage, they can have brainstem damage, they can be uh, spinal cord injuries so that they need a respirator. And they would, they would all these people would have just died and not created a, a, a dilemma in the old days. But because our medical technology has progressed, the old standard is too crude, and we've got to come up with a new one. Um, but just as uh, he explains, people, uh, actually he uses the analogy of the um, geocentric view of the universe that's had the Earth at the center of the universe and everything rotating around it, because of course, this was influenced by religion. We are God's creatures, so therefore we're the center of the universe, so everything must rotate around us. But the more our telescopes improved, the more we saw things whose movement could not be explained in terms of a rotation around us. They seemed to be doing uh, something different. So people tried to come up with, uh, with wrinkles that made sense of the movement. So actually, they are rotating around us, but they're also rotating around uh, in in funny they're rotating in a funny way but really it was just a patch and the new theory that was replaced that Copernicus came up with is that the the we're rotating around the Sun the Sun is actually the center of our solar system uh, so while trying to cling to the old theory you make all these sort of patches uh, and one of the patches that we made is what the Harvard committee did, said is that, oh, okay, actually you're dead when your whole brain 
dies so that breathing humans are dead. And this allows us to be taking organs without actually killing anyone because they're already dead. Where a singer is saying, oh, come on, you're killing them. Uh, just, it's okay, because sometimes it's okay to kill people when their quality of life is, is, is low. But you've got to get over this, this idea that you can never kill anybody for any purpose. Uh, that's the old ethic. We've got to go to a quality of life ethic. Okay, so the patch is our death redefined so that breathing humans are dead. This distinction between ordinary and extraordinary treatment. Euthanasia is permitted if the intention is to relieve pain. This is something called the doctrine of double effect. So we saw in, in one case where a woman had agonizing arthritis and the, a doctor gave her a lethal dosage of morphine. Clearly his intent was to cause her death, but he was let off because, because we all agree that she, it, was, it, it was merciful to kill her. So uh, what Singer says is, yes, he should get off, although he did kill her, but it was killing her for a good reason. Whereas the old ethic says, well, we don't want to punish him because we think what he did was good, but we can't say that it's killing him because that's ruled out by our ethic. We're not allowed to kill people. So what do we say? Oh, we say that his intention was to, uh, to ease her pain. And it's just an unfortunate side effect that it caused her death. But because he intended the right thing, easing her pain, then we can forgive the death. Uh, again, Singer says this is just a this is just a sign that you're trying desperately to preserve an ethic that you should abandon. Uh, this idea that we're allowed non-treatment for disabled infants. This is like the case of the Down syndrome ch child with the esophageal blockage. That you're allowed to not treat them because you're not actually killing them. You're just not saving them. And Singer says that's bogus. You 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 have the same effect. And you're intending the same effect, so admit it. Um, denying that humans exist before birth or viability. Yes, uh, if you want to allow abortion, but you want to cling to the sanctity of life ethic, then you have to claim that you're not really killing the fetus because it's not yet a human. Of course it's a human, says uh, Singer, but it might not yet be a person. Okay, so what you've then got to admit is that some humans are not persons and it's okay to kill those humans. But you can't deny that it's a human because it's obviously, again, not a goldfish or something. Um, and as this, uh, he says, the old ethic puts a taboo on comparisons between disabled humans and non-humans of any kind. That is, you can't, uh, Singer got into trouble for saying that some humans are not as smart as dogs. And he says, that's just true. Some humans are not as smart as dogs. Certainly, newborn babies aren't as smart as a good dog. Um, you know, their brains aren't formed enough. There's nothing wrong with that. What, but somehow there's this taboo in comparing humans with non-humans. It's seen as sacrilegious. And he says, we've got to get over that. Um, so, the old commandments. Let's list them all. Treat all human life as of equal worth. But we don't really believe that. Look at Joey Fiore, who was uh, the motorcyclist who was in a persistent vegetative state. Anencephalic baby K. Both of them are kept alive on radiators, respirators for years. And that just doesn't seem right. Never intentionally take human life. Um, but what about Dr. Shan's dilemma? He could have saved one child if he could have taken the organs from the anencephalic child. Never take your own life and always try to prevent others taking theirs. Again, we don't seem to believe this. We uh, look at the case of Dr. Jack Kevorkian in Michigan. Um, he was uh, imprisoned for inventing a machine that allowed uh, people to kill themselves who otherwise couldn't weren't able, because they were so disabled, weren't able to do it. He, he designed something so that even someone very disabled could flick uh, a switch and, and cause themselves to be injected. Or I can't remember if it was gas or injection, and basically kill themselves. He invented a death machine, um, and he was put in prison for it because he was helping people to commit suicide, and that was seen as wrong. Um, never take your own life. Yeah, uh, be fruitful and multiply. That's the old commandment. But as he says, I think we've got enough humans 
the planet can't sustain it. Certainly, um, uh, people like American, North Americans, and and Western Europeans and Australasians, we use far more resources than we should. Certainly, in comparison to people in the developing world, and it's quite all right if we decide to have fewer children. Uh, in this section, they reference Onan. Um, Onan is in the bi is a biblical character who was uh, chastised for masturbating. the The phrase used in the King James Bible is he spilled his seed upon the ground. He obviously jerked off is the uh, implication. And this reminds me of a joke. Uh, why did Granny call her pet parrot Onan? Because he always spilled his seed on the ground. Um, there, I've explained the joke to you, so it isn't funny. But uh, if you if you came across that name and you weren't familiar with it, shame on you. You should read your King James Bible, because then you would learn about masturbation. Um, rule number five: Treat all human life as always more precious than any non-human life. Again, this gets into uh, chapter eight of this book, where he talks about his uh, his animal. Um, his animal rights, again, I use the term rights loosely, but his, his advocacy for animals. He, uh, Singer is opposed to, for example, testing of, uh, of like, like, did you know that they, uh, on some shampoo bottles, it says not tested on animals. If your shampoo bottle does not do that, then there's a good chance that they tested it by cutting the eyelids off rabbits so that they cannot close their eyes and squirting it into the eyes of rabbits until they go blind. And they have, it has to meet a certain kind of threshold um, before it's sa safe for humans. But that's what they do. They test it. Uh, testing on animals means stuff like that. And it's for things like perfumes and stuff like that. And Singer is opposed to that. He says that's, that doesn't give the benefit to humans that makes it worthwhile mistreating animals like that. <coughs> Now, even Singer would say some testing of drugs on animals may be justifiable because he says that some lives are more valuable than others and the lives of some lower animals are not as valuable as conscious adult humans and that therefore the needs of the adult humans are more important than the needs of the, uh, of the animals and we can test on those animals. So he's not against all animal testing, but he's against a, a large amount of the testing that goes on. So the new commandments that he says should replace the old sanctity of life ethic, which is the quality of life ethic, says first one, instead of uh, treat all human life as equal worth, that's the old one, the, the new one is recognize that the worth of human life varies. Factors affecting the wor worth are consciousness. So for example, you, the life of you and me is more valuable than an anencephalic baby's because they'll never be conscious or than Tony Bland's. Capacity for physical, social and mental interaction with other beings. Uh, now if you bring that in of course that's going to affect some conscious but severely intellectually disabled people because they are conscious they're capable of feeling pain so they meet the first one but they have uh, very little capacity for social or mental interaction with other beings. Having conscious preferences for continued life. Again, Singer doesn't think that it's necessarily wrong to kill most non-human animals because they don't have a conception of their future life. They don't make plans. Whereas we do, and that's why killing us is bad, because you're thwarting our desires, that we our plans for our future life. Um, having enjoyable experiences. If, like Lillian Boys, you are in such ag constant agony um, that either you are sedated to the point of unconsciousness or you're conscious and in terrible pain, then your life is no longer valuable and it is okay for you to choose to end it and it's okay for someone to help you to end it out of mercy. Uh, you've got to have take into account others' attitudes towards your life. So, for example, I think it was Baby K, who was anencephalic. The reason why anencephalic, the reason why um, Baby K was kept alive was because the mother insisted that uh, she be kept alive. 
um, because the mother believed that all lives were equal and that even though her baby had no capacity for thought or feeling, it was wrong to allow her to die. Now, if, for example, somebody is independently wealthy and they can afford their own respirator and they want to keep the anencephalic baby alive as long as uh, it can live, then we cannot intervene. That's up to them. So others' attitude towards you affects it. Uh, but when it comes to like a national health service and we have to make a decision between, uh, a, say, the mother of baby K insisting that her baby be kept alive on a respirator or using the respirator in a, I don't know if you can use the same respirator, but let's say you can, using a, a respirator in, to fight COVID-19, then I'm sorry, baby K's interests should be trumped because her life is of less value than somebody who can potentially uh, survive COVID-19 and has conscious life. Um, so that brings in finite medical resources again. Uh, and he, what he points out, Singer points out, is that in none of these cases is defining death the important issue. And that's sort of what Ar Ari Jaffe uh, is saying in um, his article, Are Recent Defenses of the Brain Death Concept Adequate? He's pointing out that we're, tr we're trying to define death as part either uh, whole brain death or higher brain death or brain stem death, which is irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness and the ability to breathe. So that would be people um, who need a respirator to breathe. Their brain, in other words, their brain stem can do some things, but it can't handle breathing. Uh, so if you can survive without a respirator, you would be alive by brainstem, uh, by the brainstem criterion, but you would be dead by the higher brain death criterion. Um, so is this person alive or dead? Uh, Singer is saying it doesn't matter. What matters is the quality of their life. And Ari Joffe is making the same point, essentially. He says uh, doctors are being asked to focus on whether or not someone is alive because we want doctors to strive to preserve all life so we're clinging to the sanctity of life thing we we don't want doctors making quality of life distinctions um, and you can see why we might not want to because then people are worried that pe uh, that you know old people they won't try and treat say someone who is actually this is kind of what people are saying uh, a, a lot of people are saying, you know, old people are the ones who are disproportionately dying of COVID-19. And some people are saying, well, it was their time anyway. Those people are making quality of life distinctions. They're clearly not saying everybody's life is equal. Although I, you can bet a lot of those people are the same ones who would claim that they had a sanctity of life ethic. And a lot of those people, I bet, would be anti-abortion. That's just my bet. Um when in fact they're making a quality of life distinction. And they're making a quality of life decision that seems to bring in factors that Singer would say are not relevant, like how much longer you've got. That's not in his list. Uh, some old people, some very old people, are not in great pain. They're still conscious. They're, you know, my memory is not what it was. Their memory is not what it was, but they can carry on conversations. They clearly can take pleasure from things telling you the same old story for a hundred times, that seems to give them great pleasure. Um, and that, you know, they certainly don't fall below a certain threshold for continued life, but people are making those decisions. Uh, number two, uh, this is of the new singer's new commandments. Oh, I just want to, I'm not saying much about Joffe. Joffe is interesting for the details. Uh, so look at the polls and, and he, he interviews, uh, he talks about interviews with healthcare workers and what they actually say about when people are alive or dead. And they seem to regard people who would be dead by these criteria as alive. You know, someone like Tony Bland, doctors seem to view them as alive, but they also seem to view them as someone that it's okay to unplug the, um, unplug the respirator. They're alive because you have to keep caring for them. You have to turn them so they don't get bed sores. You have to change their diapers if they, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you have to change their sheets. You have to do all these things to care for them. 
but at the same time it's okay to unplug the respirators so where on the one hand we're saying you all you got to care about is whether they are alive or dead but clearly we're making decisions about certain whether certain lives are worth it so uh joffe's conclusion sounds a lot like um singers he says this is not an argument to clarify where brain death may be death is on page 318 the joffe article as this paper argues the medical and societal consensus was based on flawed concepts and therefore brain death being legally accepted as death is a legal fiction almost exactly what singer says i suggest that it may be more appropriate to argue that the state of brain death is such a profound devastating condition that it may suffice to allow organ donation with consent even though the donor is not dead until after organ harvest until after organ harvest discontinuation of ventilation and irreversible loss of circulation several other authors have argued along the same lines including singer incidentally in the news just the other day was that they made a change in britain that the assumption is that you are an organ donor unless you explicitly say otherwise so that's the reverse of the way we normally do it um normally you have to explicitly say i wanted to say on my driver's license that i'm an organ donor and if it doesn't they can't take your organs in england they've done said the smith switch if it says nothing on your driver's license they can take your organs you have to explicitly say don't harvest my organs um and i think that that's actually a good decision because a lot of people just don't would be willing to donate their organs they just don't think of getting a card to say so um so it means that a lot more organs will be available for donation if people you know die in car accidents and stuff um take responsibility for the consequences of your actions this is the second of singer's new commandments on page 195 in action that causes death is in general just the same as actively causing death so he's saying in the case of the down's child who has an esophageal blockage admit you're deciding that they should die so own that decision and if that's what you're going to do and you think it's justified then bring it about swiftly give them an overdose of morphine or whatever um in action that causes death is in general just the same as actively causing death this distinction between active and passive euthanasia is a bogus one um now he does qualify this he says society that doesn't a uh, society that doesn't help others in other words uh, where there are no good samaritans can exist whereas a society with constant murder cannot so that's why we've had the priority of a commandment against active killing but in in medical decisions you're essentially it's the same thing uh respect a person's desire to live or die that is uh he's saying we should allow um we should allow assisted euthanasia killing a person against his or her against his, her or his will is a much more serious wrong than killing a being that is not a person um whereas killing someone who wants to die but cannot do it themselves that is okay bring children into the world only if they're wanted that's obvious that's contraception but of course he, there's an interesting bit of history of how recent it is that contraception has been allowed um and of course there's still a debate about whether or not you can use plan b whether or not you should be able to get that over the counter or whether or not contraception should be covered by insurance uh that's still a debate and singer says it shouldn't be do not discriminate on the basis of species again this is back to the animal issue um here are four possible reasons that could make it wrong to kill a person she has constant preferences conscious preferences for continuing to live she's capable of enjoyable experiences doing so would bring grief to her relatives doing so would cause alarm to others in similar circumstances those things can apply to non-humans as well as humans certainly if we come across alien species but it might be true of families of gorillas or uh possibly families of dolphins or even possibly parrots parrots there are parrots that have been taught to use language and can solve quite complex puzzles crows too crows are very clever um okay so he says once we've got this new ethic it can bring us some answers to the issues that 
we've discussed in this book. So brain death, anencephaly, cortical death, and PBS. The new commandment settled Dr. Shan's dilemma in the case of baby Teresa and Valentina. If you remember, those were ones who, who were cortically dead and their parents wanted to allow their organs to be harvested, but they were blocked because of the law at the time. Um, abortion and the brain dead pregnant woman. This is in a chapter that you didn't read. This is in the opening chapter. Uh, a couple of Tricia Marshall and Marion Plock, uh, one in America, one in Germany, were were pregnant women who had uh, brain accidents where they're cortically dead and they were kept alive in an attempt to uh, bring the fetus to term. Now, the discussion of infants on page 210 is where I think Singer is at his most controversial. Um, he does say that uh, infanticide, in terms of the state of the baby, there can be practically no relevant differences between the capacities of a baby and a late-term fetus. But we are allowed to abort one and not kill the other at the moment. What Singer says is, that's right, that's inconsistent, we should be allowed to kill both of them. What, of course, I think most, uh, well, most anti-abortion activists, when they bring up this, say we shouldn't be allowed to kill either of them. Uh, so both want consistency, but in consistency of not killing, in the pro-lifers and consistency of killing in Singer's case. But he does say there are, there are, even though the capacities of the newborn and the fetus may be identical, there are differences in that the mother's right to control her body is no longer relevant when it's born. So it's no longer her bodily autonomy is the issue because the baby is no longer inside her. And there may be other people who want the baby. Um, you know, for adoption. But, he says, whether or not the child continues to live should be up to the parents and not a judge, as they are charged with its care. Uh, if we had a system where every unwanted baby would have a good life and uh, the state would pay for a great education and ensure that they get um, great parenting, then it, this wouldn't be an issue and they wouldn't be allowed to make this distinction. But in a country where that is not true, they should get the choice to decide whether or not they're going to support them. And this is where he discusses the Downs infants, like John Pearson, who was rejected by his mother. This is a case discussed in one of the others, thankfully in the old days, but probably this still goes on, where the baby was born Downs and the mother just says, I don't want it. And the, essentially the doctors took, it, took the child away and allowed it to die. Um, Nowadays, I think that would be a, tried as murder, uh, but Singer would say um, that that is up to the parents if they're the ones ha that have to raise it. Now, he, this is where he talks about the book, Should the Baby Live? Um, I think Singer will have lost a lot of people at this point. Uh, num number four on page 218 of the issues that he's discussing people. Um, the commandment three of the new ethic says that every person has the right to life. Persons should mostly therefore be per pe beings who can fear their own death. Um, but one can choose to waive one's rights as someone who really wants to die should have that right. So the, the, the beings that have the right to life are persons. So the right to life is something that applies to persons and not necessarily humans. So because Tony Bland, is, is, although he's a human, he's no longer a person, he doesn't have the right to life that you or I have because we are persons, or that E.T. would have, even though he's not human. Um, finally, he sums up, there are two central assumptions of the old ethic that Singer rejects because he says they are untenable. One, we are responsible for what we intentionally do in a way that we are not for what we deliberately fail to prevent. In other words, the action-inaction distinction. He says, that's just bogus. Look, allowing a baby to starve to death is killing it. So admit that you're killing it. Now, either it's wrong or it's right, but allowing it to starve to death is, if anything, more wrong because it takes longer and might cause suffering than giving it an injection of morphine. So throw that one out. 
and two, the lives of all and only members of our species are more worthy of protecting than any other being. Than any other being, it says no. Some members of our species, their life is not worth the same as ours, like anencephalic infants, and in fact, the life of Coco is worth more than an anencephalic infant because Coco the gorilla is capable of conscious thought and language, in the anencephalic infant is not, and it's just speciesism to say that an anencephalic baby because it's human is more valuable than uh, Coco's. Again that's pretty radical but Singer has books to argue for this that we can't get into now. Alright we covered a lot of ground in there I hope you found it interesting and uh, I'll see you next unit.